Up next is our Marga Darshan. The feature piece carries the weighty task of sharpening and coalescing the many voices of the Varsha Pratipada Sansad into a message, a message that we Hindus are ready to address, the social and ethical issues of our country, that we have a platform and a vision for our nation which should awaken a dialogue in our communities, bridge barriers and inspire change. And none of this has been done and continues to do so and, and continues to, to be like this in Trinidad and Tobago, so ably well as by our own Pooja Swami Prakash and Andaji. Swamiji's words, eloquent and fiery in turn, bring a lawyer's precision, a leader's dynamism, and a master's wisdom to the issue before us today. His work has spread the length and breadth of Trinidad, the Caribbean, and the United States, Canada, and more. He is one to whom no description can do no justice, and known to all active Hindus present today. Without further ado, we welcome him on stage to deliver our Marga Darshan. Thank you, Madam Chairperson. We have many, many meetings to come to what I am going to say today. Most of it is what was discussed in our various meetings. <coughs> I have just here and there added a few little things. In one of those meetings, I was asking Raviji a very uh, nice and simple question. How do you make holy water? <laughs> he said, I don't know. I said, man, you put it in a pot and you boil the hell out of it. <laughs> <laughs> you get holy water. Ravaji said, you should start with that. <laughs> so I did. You have heard of all the issues. I'm going to reiterate some of them, and then we're going to look a little bit deeper into this whole issue that we are dealing with. In 2007, the Siddhas Sadhu Mandir in Waterloo was desecrated. Then the Makpin Hindu temple, which is very close here, and the Vedic Mission Mandir. And in 2008, the Kolahal Mandir. I'm quoting from an article in the Trinidad Guardian. Eh? The others, you did not hear about them, but the Guardian documented all of this. As recent as 2013, just recently, the Sri Shankar Mandir in Felicity was attacked three times within four days. Again, Guardian. This last Diwali in Antigua, you know what happened. Three Hindus were arrested, imprisoned, charged, convicted, and deported from Antigua to India. Upon investigation, it was discovered that they were doing puja. The police and the media and everything, and the court said they were doing obia. And you know, we are not talking about whether they were deported for obia or not. Even if they were deported for obia, what is wrong with that? I mean, if, if they were doing obia, what is wrong with that? How, how deep the problem is, we have to go right into it, which we'll be doing today. And these are not the only things that beleaguer Hindus in our country and in this part of the world. Last year, Rayon would have uh, related to you, when the Hanuman Chalisa was being chanted, people were telling, you know, on social media and, and in different places. Close your windows, cover your houses. Don't let that air come into your homes. When the, 
the officer, the passport office told the woman to go home and take a bath and cleanse yourself and then come back. Somehow the Sindhu defiled her. It brought some devil or something on her. So she had to go home and, and the, the American embassy, which is right there, doesn't object to the Sindhu, right? But our own, in our own country, the officer says, go home and take it out. In one more story, very important story, which was not related here today. In 2007, two armed bandits entered the home of a Hindu family in Charlieville. They collected all the money and jewelry and all that sort of thing. One of the bandits had the gall in front of the people that take out his cell phone and tell his girlfriend that today I bring in real nice jewelry for you. But after that, when they were about to leave, he noticed that in a special drawer of the room, there were all the clothing that that Hindu wife used in puja and in this type of ceremonies and all the special things. He took out everything from the drawer, threw it in a corner. This is the last act before leaving. Threw it in a corner and proceeded to urinate on clothing while shouting racist slurs. This is what Hindus live with in this nation. You know also that it took the Sanatana Dharma Mahasabha to take the government to court and to take this thing all the way to the Privy Council of England to get them to remove the Trinity Cross. Something that should have been done by mature reflection as a burgeoning nation had to be done and removed by a foreign court. We, couldn't, we didn't have the ability to reflect by ourselves to see that this thing is not proper. The court in Trinidad and Tobago, even though, so listen to this, this is from the, from the Guardian. The Lord, law lords of England reversed the decision of both the local high court and the court of appeal, which had refused to declare the Trinity Cross illegal. They refused to declare the Trinity Cross illegal. And see the next part. Even though it found that the Trinity Cross was discriminatory. It discriminated against non-Christians. But even though it was discriminatory, they didn't want to declare it as illegal. It means to say that the court in Trinidad and Tobago also was not prepared to uphold the constitution of Trinidad and Tobago, which forbids discrimination. <laughs> this is how deep this problem is. Even a court, the highest court of the land, is not prepared to de defend our constitution. It is clear that Hindus continue to be victimized, and the source of this victimization runs very deep. We have been victims of an underlying ideology etched onto the minds of many that he who does not follow the religion of the former masters are pagans, those who do not follow. The drumming of this ideology deep into the recesses of our psyche was the final nail in the coffin of slavery, which both Indians and Africans and all the other communities in this nation have endured. Massa kept our hard drive for storage, but he exchanged our operating system and software. In that hard drive, he kept all his ideology. Before continuing, let us examine exactly what is pagan and what is paganism. Dr. Arvind Singh already related much of this to you. Derived from the Latin, paganus, literally, literally it means of or relating to the countryside. 
country dweller, a villager, by extension, a rustic, unlearned, primitive, savage, a bumpkin, uh, uh, all that kind of thing. The second meaning of, of, of the word is, it means anybody who doesn't follow the Abrahamic religions. The word also has been used synonymously with idolaters, infidels, heathens, heretics, devil worshippers, and so on. You know all of these words. In all of this, the general connotation of the word is derogatory in nature. It is meant to put you down. It is meant to stamp on you psychologically. It's meant to step on your head. The use of the word. It is used to deny some as having a valid or legitimate religion. We are convinced, we, and on this, in this answer, we are convinced that this residual colonial ideology has led to many of the atrocities which I just spoke about. Many of the atrocities which I just spoke about on Hindus. There are many problems, though, with this ideology, this colonial ideology, which has been stamped onto our psyche. The present carriers of the ideology are them, this is the first problem. The present carriers, those who carry the ideology, who are unwilling to free themselves from this ideology, are themselves victims of the ideology. The second thing is, the ideology itself is counterproductive, and we'll see all of these in turn just now. And third, it is internally flawed. Which ideology? The ideology that those who do not follow the Abrahamic religions, they are pagans, they're invalidated, they're somehow they don't have a valid viewpoint, a worldview. Let us look at all of these defects with this ideology. All of us have been victims, all the peoples of Trinidad and Tobago have been victims of this experience of slavery. Slavery and European domination. The first peoples even suffered genocide. I don't know if my good friend, Mr. Hernandez, is here. But he will tell you how and how many were slaughtered by European colonizers and settlers in this country and all across the Caribbean. We only have a handful of first peoples in Trinidad and Tobago. What happened to all of them? Removed. Indentorship was just another form of legitimate slavery. Each group had its own grassroots religion come, bring, brought with them. Throughout the Caribbean, the first peoples were massacred and those who survived were forcibly converted African slaves were put in chains and ushered into churches on Sunday mornings with whips and dogs on the two sides. It is only with the coming of the Indians that the violence started to slowly wane. The, the, the first peoples and the Africans suffered a way significant more violence than the Indians, not that the Indians did not suffer. The violence was much more there prior to that. But as the violence started to wane when, with the coming of Indians, it was replaced by a more virulent and insidious form of domination. That is mental domination, worse than physical domination. Gandhiji was physically dominated. He said, in, in, in prison, you can put me in prison, I physically lock me up, you know, but you really can't stop what I think. But when I've taken over the mind, that is a more violent form of slavery. Listen to Macaulay's words about ruling India. He said, we must at present do our best to form a class who may be interpreters between us and the millions whom we govern. A class of persons, and see the part, this part now, Indian in blood and color, but English in taste, opinions, in morals, and in intellect. 
to that class, we may leave it to refine the vernacular dialects of the country. To enrich those dialects with terms of science borrowed from Western nomenclature. And to render them by degrees fit vehicles. This is the whole plan of colonization of the mind. Eh? To render them fit vehicles for conveying the knowledge to the great masses of the population. Whose knowledge? The knowledge of the colonizer. Well, I say, Macaulay's plan worked. It had already worked in many parts of the world. The result is we have, a nation, we have nations across the world who consider themselves to be free and independent, but who are operating on British software. We walk like Massa, we talk like Massa, we eat Massa's food, educated with Massa's syllabus, wear Massa's clothes, coated, booted, and suited, protect Massa's morals, opinions, political system, jurisprudence, and most of all, his white male God and all the tenets of his religion. In this historical calamity, there are two things that gnaw and at and undermine our very soul. There are two people living inside every one of us. One who thinks that he's free from slavery and domination because slavery was abolished in the, 18, in the 1830s. One who thinks that he's free. And another in abject mental slavery, dancing to the tune of masses, music, food, clothes, moral, religion, and worldview. We have all become schizophrenic because of this experience. Because in all of us, there are two people living. One who thinks he is free, but one who is totally bound. The second result of this insidious historical experience is that those within the colonies who make an attempt to emancipate themselves from mental slavery, as Bob Marley said, they are psychologically battered, belittled, suppressed, and relegated to the fringes of society with words like pagans, heathens, idolaters, heretics, devil worshippers, and so on. By who? Other groups who themselves are victims of this stealthy, cancerous malaise of mental slavery. This ideology of the colonial masters is also counterproductive. A nation's capital is really in its people. The capital of any nation is really its people. For any experiment in nation building, which we are talking about all the time, for any experiment in nation building, we need sound, robust, integrated human beings charged with a zeal and an enthusiasm to work together for the common good. But when indoctrination and software grafting is so thorough that we develop deep fear by the mere chanting of Hanuman Chalisa, that you have to close up your houses and all. We develop such a deep fear that we have to close our houses and cover our houses, close the windows. Then I see a nation that is psychologically fractured. The building and enhancing of human capital needs work. We need to talk, to discuss, to cooperate, to free ourselves from mental slavery. In charting out, any glorious destiny for this nation. Arjuna's chariot cannot move forward if the four horses are pulling in different directions. If one group attacks and desecrates our temples, it means massa rules. It is not that the group is to blame. Massa is ruling. And that means we have a lot of work to do. It also demonstrates fissures in the national psyche that are antithetical to national development. National development requires that we address these schisms on a daily basis. We have to reach out to the community. You see, if we are seeing, if we can see that we are in mental slavery, we have to try to help those to come out of that and to think 
how nicely Attila spoke about retaining her own freedom. Her own freedom. So to open people's eyes to their own freedom. This type of debilitating ideology of the colonial masters, when etched onto the psyche of a people, works against nation building. It is neither good for the victims nor the perpetrators. It enfeebles and psychologically handicaps a nation. So it's counterproductive. It is, that's very the, the country will always remain third world in spite of all the wealth that we, we have. Massa's ideology is also internally flawed. If we look closely at Massa's Abrahamic ideology, ideological inheritance, we will see many intrinsic flaws. Massa calls us pagan because we do not follow the religion he tried to impose on us. But hey, what to tell you? We belong to a religion that teaches us to worship the earth, not to ravage and plunder it. We have respect for the environment. We belong to a religion that has never invaded anybody's country and forcefully converted them. Respect for the other. We belong to a religion that believes in the natural diversity <clears throat> of the world in terms of belief, faith, practice, and so on. Respect for nat natural diversity. We belong to a religion that has never killed anybody in the name of God. Respect for life. We belong to a religion <clears throat> where neither psychological nor physical slavery has ever been condoned. Respect for freedom. We belong to a religion which doesn't seek to convert anyone. Respect for religion. We belong to a religion which espouses a special monotheism that is inclusive and not exclusive. We value inclusiveness. As Hindus, we worship trees, rivers, animals, the sun, the moon, stars, earth, mountains, and all living and non-living things. When I say namaste to you, I thereby worship you also. On the other hand, <clears throat> the world has been heir to an insolent history which has used political and military power to back masses religious ideologies which are exclusive, <clears throat> divisive, murderous, genocidal, belittling, downright dangerous for the continued survival of the species. This same history has branded me as a pagan. <clears throat> if we do an, a sober analysis of our historical antecedents, we realize that it is way better to be a pagan anytime. In fact, if you care about saving the species, you better join me in being a pagan. <laughs> Hindu theology espouses a special type of monotheism which is intensely and remarkably inclusive. The monotheism of the Abrahamic religions, which Massa imposed on us by contrast, dan is dangerously exclusive. You are excluded from salvation, heaven, etc. And if you do not conform, nay, <clears throat> you are denied any legitimacy of belief or even life if you do not conform. You denied life also. You have to conform. We are branded as devil worshippers. Pagans are branded as devil worshippers. But the exclusive nature of the Abrahamic religion has made it such that the greatest demonic acts perpetrated by the species have emerged not from pagans, <clears throat> but from those who brand us as pagans, from the Abrahamic faiths themselves, starting with Columbus. In school, we were taught to see that this man was a genius, a saint, a hero, <clears throat> the world's greatest explorer, a statesman far excellent, and so on. But documented history and, and Columbus's own logbook show the atrocities he perpetrated on the natives of the Indies, all in the name of directives from the church. The Spanish conquistador, conquistador Fernando Cortes was responsible for mass genocides right here in neighboring Mexico against the Aztecs. Think they call us demons, but the demonic acts, <coughs> the demonic acts uh, originated from from where? All of Cortez's acts were supported by papal bull. 
Here in Trinidad and all the Caribbean islands, we have a mere handful of cursed peoples only remaining now. Who we ask has perpetrated all the demonic acts of the world. <clears throat> that ideology, that scripture, that religion also has left us confused. I told you just now, schizophrenic and also confused with so many different uh, thoughts in our mind. It was Jomo Kenyatta, the first Kenyan president, who said a quote I heard from Reviji way back in 1982 or something. When the missionaries arrived, the Africans had the land, and the missionaries had the Bible. They taught us how to close our eyes and pray. And when we opened our eyes, <coughs> the missionaries had the land, and we had the Bible. quote is also attributed to Desmond Tutu. The Bible <coughs> has also replaced, see the Bible, they replace the land. When they take the land and give the Bible. But the Bible has also replaced logic and rationality with what? Belief and superstition among species, the species. God becomes white male Jealous, biased, because he has chosen people. Hates gay, forbids tattoos. A tattoo was something they encountered long ago when they went to India. All the old people used to have tattoos. So God hates all of these things. That is a God, very clearly, you can see it is a God that is <clears throat> made up by some person. I like making breakfast in the morning. In Hinduism, <laughs> by contrast, God is dark, as in Rama and Krishna. God is white also, as in Lord Shiva. He is Dhavala Vapusha. Dhavala Vapuhu. Lord Shiva. White bodies. The problem with this belief system, devoid of rationality, the problem with this is that this belief system, which is devoid of rationality, uh, this is a great problem. It works itself up into law. And so the law itself, which is supposed to be a social contract to protect the individual rights, ends up becoming a tool for persecution and prosecution of people of different religions, as we just saw in the case of Antigua. It is very clear in the Antigua case. Massa's ideology <coughs> worked itself up into the law, not, not only into the psyche of the people, but up into the law also. And it was used as a tool for persecution. The Antiguan constitution very clearly protects religious freedoms. Very clearly. Listen to this, to this section. It says, except with his own consent, no person shall be hindered in the enjoyment of his freedom of conscience. And for the purposes of this section, the said freedom includes freedom of thought and religion, freedom to change his religion or belief, and freedom to either alone or in community to worship. And both in public and private. The men were worshiping in private now. There's freedom of religion guaranteed in the Constitution. This is Antiguan Constitution, 11.1. The 1904 Obia Act, under which the Hindus were charged, is unmistakably in, contra in contravention of this Constitution. But here is a very, very clear case where we see when there's a toss up between logic and rationality, which is enshrined in the Constitution. <clears throat> because in a cosmopolitan society, you have to protect the rights of everybody. The superstitions of biblical law won, and not the rationality of the Constitution. The, the, according to the biblical law, the Obia Act was drafted because it, con it really didn't sit well with the existing dominant religion at the time. The religious undertone of the Obia Act blinded the people who reported the puja, the police, the prosecutor, the judge, and everyone involved in the case. 
An act having its genesis in the biblical tradition is sufficient to overthrow a nation's constitution, however well conceived, when those charged with the responsibility of protecting the constitution became mental slaves of Massa's Bible. Here in Trinidad and Tobago, also, we are guaranteed all religious freedom. The, the anthem proudly proclaims that every creed and race finds an equal place. But where the biblical ideology of the illegitimacy of other religions have become etched onto the minds of victims of slavery, i.e. all of us, the victims themselves become the perpetrators to ensure that the constitutional guarantee of freedom of religion, the logical thing in a democratic state, does not gather teeth. Unless there is a move by all stakeholders in the nation to stamp out this virulent form of mental slavery, we do not see that the destruction of our temples will stop. This will continue. And therefore, we raise this issue this year so that those who are the carriers, these days the carrier word is going around quite often with Zika and all of that, you know. Those who are carriers of this <coughs> Christian ideology, which is exclusive, which excludes so many, we are inviting them to sit with us and discuss and reflect so that we can stamp out this type of ideology that has become the bane of our nation. We are prepared. We know that there are going to be more. It, it has not served. 2007 was spanning all the way up till now. There are going to be more. But please remember, you have been made into an, a carrier. Sit with us, let us talk, and let us try to collectively remove this great and uh, parasitic problem that we are having in our nation. I thank you very much for having me today. Thank you.